Good evening. How is everybody this evening? All right. My name is Greg Gorga. I'm the executive director here at the San Barbara Maritime Museum. I want to welcome you to Sunk Without Warning, Athenia and the Start of World War II by Tom Sanger. Uh, I want to acknowledge our board members who are in the audience. If you can raise your hands, our board members. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, let's hear it for them. Uh, I have, uh, I think, two past board presidents, Gail Anakushin in the back there, and, and, and the amazing Gene Schuyler. Yes. I want to thank Marie Morris Rowe, our lecture series sponsor. Thank you very much. Yes, let's a big hand for her. And also want to thank Giordano's for supplying our waters and beers and Martelletta wines for our white wine tonight. Let's hear for them. And also August Ridge, the great red wines, and they have a tasting room on Figueroa Street right off of uh, State Street. So if you get a chance, go over there for that. Anybody go over to Chuck's and have their dinner special tonight? A little few of you, all right. Yeah, I saw a few of you over there. Going to go afterwards? All right. <laughs> Wonderful. They got it all planned. Okay. <laughs> You do. They have a dinner special. Just mention you are here. Andy, you don't get the deal, but anybody else can mention Maritime Museum all night long, I believe. I'll take my name tag off. Take your name tag off, yes. Uh, and also, just so you know, we are recording this. It will be on uh, TV Santa Barbara and then on our website. Uh, it takes a few weeks to get that going, but it uh, will happen. Uh, exciting and very, very busy uh, time here at the Maritime Museum. I'm so happy you were here tonight and not yesterday because there was stuff all over the place here yesterday. Uh, so, uh, we have installed, well, let me go through a few other things and then tell you our exciting news. So um, upstairs, uh, from photo photo photography to chalk drawings, painting by Jack Methune, uh, that is still on display. Uh, it'll be up through the end of September. Uh, so if you haven't seen that, they're very fun, whimsical, colorful uh, paintings up there. Um, and they're all for sale, and uh, all the proceeds Jack donates to the Maritime Museum. We're very excited. Uh, you saw it in the video on Saturday, we hope, weather permitting, the tall ship Spirit of Dana Point arrives from the Ocean Institute. Yes, isn't that fun? Uh, we'll be here for four weeks. We start putting fourth graders who are studying their California uh, history on board for the night starting Monday. So if you're around at 3 o'clock, stop by our patio, watch them get mustered. Be careful, they might bring you into the group and then you're gonna spend the night on the ship doing some jobs. All the kids have different activities on board. One group cooks uh, breakfast and dinner for everybody. One group does uh, the lines and rigging, brings barrels of water onto the deck. Uh, another group rows in the water looking for hides and tallow that the crew has hidden in the harbor. And one crew is at the beck and call of the captain. Uh, and all of them get to spend two hours during the evening doing night watch. So thank you for your support. It allows us to do that free of charge for local Title I schools. Last year, we put 467 students on board for the night. Isn't that amazing? Uh, and I should mention, at the Harbor and Seafood Festival on October 13th, the tall ship will be available uh, for dockside tours, I think from 11 to about 2, 2.30. And then if you actually want to sail on the tall ship, uh, we do sell tickets for a public sale that day. Uh, it will sell out ahead of time, so you want to come to the store or check our website. Uh, you can do a public sale. You could do it as a working sale and help raise the sales yourself, so a lot of fun. Um, then next Thursday, and why we were a little busy here yesterday, we are opening up the history of oil in the Santa Barbara Channel. This is by far the biggest exhibit we've ever done. It is in six different parts of the museum. It is in, uh, in place already, so I saw some of you upstairs earlier walking around. Uh, <clears throat> if you didn't get a chance to see it tonight, come back or join us next week. There's a free reception from 5.30 to 7. But we have a piece, uh, one section of it, uh, about the first offshore oil wells in Summerlin. That's the world's first offshore oil wells uh, in our historic path. <clears throat> Over here, we talk about uh, oil and its effect on commercial diving, how Santa Barbara became the birthplace of deep water commercial diving through because of the oil industry. Upstairs, we talk about the 69 oil spill and the refugio spill, the, uh, all the different uses for oil, not just for gasoline. Uh, we talk about um, uh, there's so much I don't even remember all the things we talk about. Oh, what, what it's like to work out on the platforms. And then uh, uh, over here, uh, very closely related to our talk tonight, we talk about the shelling at Elwood, which they were going after the oil there. Uh, so very exciting for us. Uh, nice article, by the way, if you get the independent, uh, a nice article on the exhibit in there today. 
Uh, and then September 26th, uh, we have our quarterly family night. Our theme is back to school, appropriately enough. Um, there will be no uh, a lecture in October. We're just a little bit overwhelmed right now, uh, but we are back in November. Um, but I, I mentioned October 13th, the Harbor and Seafood Festival. We are also doing a special wine and seafood pairing out on our patio from 12 to 3 that day. Tickets for that are also available on our website uh, and uh, in the store. All the proceeds support the museum. And then um, <clears throat> October 18th, we open a new photography exhibit called Face to Face with the Great White Sharks by Ralph Clevenger. Uh, and there are 12 amazing pieces. <clears throat> he, uh, Ralph used to teach at um, the Brooks Institute with Ernie Brooks, who was here today, actually, uh, also today. <clears throat> Excuse me. And, um, and so that opens October 18th. Uh, and then November 1st, we have a, another film, A City at War. And then November 8th, our lecture is Origami for an Interdependent World by Robert Salazar. So very a lot going on. Thank you for your membership, your donations, your support. Those of you who are Navigator Circle members and Flagship Society members, we could not do this without your support. <clears throat> uh, Tom has generously provided me with the shortest biography I've ever read up here. Uh, he is a native of Los Angeles, worked for the Associated Press and radio station KABC in his hometown, as well as wrote documentary scripts for the Australian Broadcasting Company in Sydney. He also enjoyed a lengthy career in corporate communications in Southern California, and he now lives in San Diego with his wife, Kay. Please join me in welcoming Tom Sanger. Well, thank you very much, Greg. I appreciate that um, introduction. And thank you, too, for uh, the Santa Barbara Maritime Museum for inviting me here to uh, be your lecture speaker this month. Um, I very much appreciate every opportunity I get to tell uh, this exciting tale that has such a personal resonance for me. Um, two things I'd like to do before we start. Number one, um, if you haven't already, uh, would you please silence or turn off your uh, electronic devices? Um, and secondly, if you could hold all your questions until the end of the presentation, I will uh, certainly try and uh, answer everything, every question you have at that point. So let's then begin. On September 3rd, 1939, with the Second World War not quite nine hours old, a German submarine, or U-boat as they were called, torpedoed the first British ship to be sunk by Germany in the war. Now the name of the ship was Athenia, and tragically, she was a, an unarmed passenger ship. Now today, hardly anyone on either side of the Atlantic has ever heard of the ship named Athenia, or knows of her historical significance. But in September of 1939, let me get this right, the torpedoing of the Athenia was front page news around the world as the British government sought to turn world opinion against the Nazi government of Germany. Now, I'm going to play for you a, a clip from a British movie tone newsreel that is fairly typical of the kind of coverage that this event uh, received in the British press at, at that time. Now this uh, recounts the arrival of Athena's survivors in Halifax, Nova Scotia after they were picked up at sea by a, an American freighter called the City of Flint. <laughs> Every one of them has a tale to tell our fancy relations in Canada or America, a tale of the heart of suffering warfare and waves of battle And I have stopped this clip at that, this point because of the woman on the right of the screen there in her dark crocheted cap. Her name was Rhoda Thomas, and she was my grandmother. Rhoda is my connection to this story because when she returned home to her family in Rochester, New York, she took the time to write a 14-page account of her experiences as an Athenia survivor. And 70 years later, when I read that account, it became the inspiration for my historical novel, Without Warning. Now, 
The book is based on actual people and events, and it follows eight individuals to tell the very human side of this tragedy. Uh, what I want to do tonight, however, is to share with you what I learned in the five years that I researched and wrote this book, most of which I couldn't put in the book, so I have this great opportunity. Uh, I will also try and tell you when we get to the end why I think it is that Athenia has faded from our collective memory. So let's start with a little bit of historical perspective. In the spring, in the summer of 1939, tensions were rising in Europe, and the man most responsible for these tensions was the German Chancellor Adolf Hitler. Now, at, in June of 39, Hitler began uh, to uh, demand from Poland some uh, per permanent territory across the Polish corridor here to connect Germany with her ethnic cousins in East Russia. He also wanted to take over the city of Danzig on the Baltic Sea because there was a great uh, number of German-speaking people who lived in that city. But the Poles let Hitler know they had no interest in negotiating away any of their territory, and they warned Germany that they would resist any attempt by Germany to take that territory by force. And at the time, Poland had an agreement with England and France that those two countries would come to Poland's aid if Poland were to be attacked by Germany. Hitler was aware of this uh, agreement, of course, but he seemed to pay it little heed. It was almost as if he believed the, uh, his army could overrun Poland before France and Germany could ever mobilize their forces, and then he would be able to deal with them separately. Well, he continued to press his demands through July, and in early August, in order to get Hitler to change his calculus uh, on these matters, England and France sent a joint delegation to Moscow to negotiate a military alliance with the Red Army of the Soviet Union. At the time, the Red Army was one of the largest standing forces in Eastern Europe. And although it wasn't as well equipped as the German army, it was large and formidable, and it would almost certainly force Hitler to back off his territorial demands. But the British government wasn't stopping at that point. They were also um, uh, increasing their own wartime preparedness plans. They were uh, laying plans for major mobilization of forces, of plans for civil defense, even plans for uh, food rationing, if it came to that. And the British Admiralty had begun to commandeer merchant ships, removing them from commercial service and converting them into ships to assist the Royal Navy. These were merchant ships that were being converted into passengers, uh, into um, uh, troop ships into hospital ships and into a kind of a fighting ship called an armed merchant cruiser. These were merchant ships that had uh, guns attached, naval guns attached to their decks so that they could assist the Royal Navy in uh, guarding the sea lanes that were so vital to the survival of the British Isles. Well, the negotiations in Moscow dragged on into August and into late August. And on August 22nd, it was the Germans who made a startling announcement that Germany and Russia had signed a non-aggression pact. This meant, in its simplest form, that neither country would attack the other country if the other country were attacked by a third party. And that, of course, meant that the Soviet Union would not be part of any alliance that might come in conflict with Germany. And this seemed to give Hitler a free hand. And so uh, the, the possibility of war became much more realistic. And within 24 hours, the American embassies on the continent and in the British Isles began to tell citizens that they should return home immediately because of the threat of war. Now, at the time, my grandmother was visiting uh, relatives in southwestern England. And she had a passage booked to return to New York City on a ship the first week in October. But those plans had to be scrapped. And uh, she suddenly found herself scrambling 
to find passage on any ship along with thousands of other Canadians and uh, uh, other Americans. And it took her two or three days and one false start, but she was finally able to secure passage on a ship called Athenia, which was due to leave Glasgow on September 1st then pick up additional passengers in Belfast and Liverpool before sailing on to Montreal, Canada. Now, Athenia was a modest, mid-sized passenger ship. She'd been plying the Atlantic for 16 years. And the owners of the ship, the Donaldson Atlantic Line, decided that to make some modifications in the ship in order to be able to accommodate the tremendous demand for passenger space. So they converted two uh, public rooms into dormitories and they adopted the policy that every cabin on the ship would accommodate four passengers. This of course meant it would be very crowded on the crossing, that men and women in their sleeping arrangements would have to be separated and families would be probably split up. But it did allow Athenia to carry 200 additional passengers than normal. Well, a few days before Athenia was due to sail, the British Admiralty issued a new directive for merchant shipping, and that was that merchant ships should sail blacked out at night because of the danger that war might be declared while they were at sea. So, with a couple of days to go, work crews came aboard Athenia and painted over every porthole and boarded up every large window uh, on the ship so that no light would escape Athenia at night. Now, September 1st, the date of Athenia's sailing was a Friday, and Europe awoke that Friday morning to the news that the German army had begun to invade Poland. War now seemed unavoidable. Quite by coincidence, on that same September 1st, the, the British government had decided to implement a long-planned voluntary evacuation of school children from large cities and uh, industrial centers that might become targets of German bombers in the event of war. Now that same uh, Friday afternoon, my grandmother was on a train heading north to Liverpool where she was going to board Athenia the next day. And as her train passed through these small towns in the countryside, she saw these sad little groupings of school children on the platforms and she described it this way uh, in her account of those events. At Gloucester, we saw the first group of evacuated children. I shall never forget it. Torn away from their homes, all with their little knapsacks on their backs, their gas masks over their shoulders, and bands with numbers on their arms in the charge of one or more teachers from different schools. Little tots, not knowing what it was all about, some crying, some laughing, unconscious of the danger they were fleeing from. It was then all the women in my compartment gave way to tears, and we began to realize how serious the situation had become. Well, in spite of the turmoil created by moving these school children, and the uncertainty caused by Germany's invasion of uh, Poland, Athenia sailed pretty much on, on schedule at about 12.30 that Friday afternoon with about 420 passengers aboard. She crossed over to uh, Belfast in Northern Ireland and that evening loaded another 130 or so passengers on board. And then overnight, she sailed back across the Irish Sea to Liverpool where she dropped anchor in the Mersey River at 7.30 on Saturday morning. A few hours later, Athenia's captain, a man named James Cook, went ashore to meet with the Admiralty officials. It had been 24 hours since Germany had invaded Poland and there had been no declaration of war from either England or France and he wanted to know what was going to happen, what was likely to happen, and how it might affect his crossing to, Mon to Canada. Well, when he returned to uh, the ship, he brought with him a new course to sail. Instead of the normal course uh, that would, he would follow to go to Montreal, he was told to sail 30 miles north of the normal shipping lanes. 
And in the event war were to be declared while he was en route, he should immediately begin sailing a zigzag course. That meant that he would maintain his general heading toward Canada, but would sail a little bit to port of that heading, then back a little bit to starboard, and then port and starboard back and forth uh, in a fairly quick succession, the idea being to make it more difficult for a U-boat to target his ship. In any case, he was told he would not have a Royal Navy destroyer uh, as, a, as a, an accompany him across the ocean as an escort. His best defense would be the wide open sea. Now, to some extent, the Admiralty had to be relying on the existence of various international maritime treaties, and one in particular called the London Submarine Protocol. That was a set of rules designed to govern how submarines would conduct themselves in future wars. And it was put together by a number of maritime nations meeting in London in 1936. And what these nations wanted to prevent was something called unrestricted submarine warfare against merchant shipping, a tactic that the Germans had used in the First World War to devastating effect. To give you a sense of how restrictive the protocol was, a submarine could not attack an unarmed, unescorted merchant ship without first giving that ship warning. And to do that, it would have to approach the ship on the surface, would have to get that ship to stop, then would put a boarding party onto the ship. And then if they found anything in the cargo that was, uh, would help a, uh, an enemy's war effort, then they could sink the ship, but there were additional regulations and rules about uh, how the crew had to be treated and how close they had to be to land, and um, it was fairly impractical. And it was intended to be. But 35 nations had signed on to the London Submarine Protocol, including Germany. But in the three years of its existence, the protocol had never been tested in any kind of major maritime conflict. So at about 4.30 that Saturday afternoon, Athena sailed as scheduled, having loaded nearly 500 more passengers on board, including my grandmother. And as she sailed down the Mersey River toward uh, the Irish Sea and beyond, she carried a total complement of 1,418 passengers and crew and of the 1,102 passengers who were on board, three quarters of them were women and children. Now I'm gonna pause here because I want to introduce you to two individuals who are going to have a significant impact on the Athena's story in the next 48 hours. Barnett Copeland was Athena's chief officer. He was the second in command to Captain Cook. He was a 32-year-old Scotsman who had gone to sea when he was only 15 years old. And by the time he was 19, uh, he had passed all the requirements for his second mate certificate and become an officer in the British merchant fleet. So he was obviously very bright and very dedicated to his work. Now, Fritz Julius Lemp was an Oberleutnant in the German Navy. He was only 26 years old and in command of a submarine, which was relatively young at this point in the war to be a submarine commander. But despite his innocent looks, he was an eight-year Navy veteran. He had volunteered for submarine service. And in the 10 months he had actually commanded a submarine, he had gained a reputation for bravado and for maintaining his cool in pressure situation. Now, the boat he commanded was U-30, and it was one of nearly 20 ocean-going attack submarines that left their ports uh, in Germany beginning as early as the third week in August to take up positions in waiting zones north and south of the British Isles. And while they were in these waiting zones, they maintained radio silence and they submerged every time they saw a plane or a boat on the horizon because every one of these captains wanted to retain an element of surprise. They believed they would be at war with England uh, and France by the time their patrol ended. 
I should mention that every one of these captains had a set of operational orders that incorporated the London submarine protocol. In addition, they were admonished not to attack passenger ships. The admiral of the German Navy, Eric Rader, had been in the German Navy in the First World War. And he was convinced that a U-boat uh, which sank the, uh, the Lusitania uh, and caused such great loss of life had, eventually, had actually turned public world opinion against Germany and had eventually brought the United States into the war on the side of the Allies and had tipped the scales against Germany. So he wanted his Navy not to attack any passenger ships. On the other hand, the man who was in charge of the German U-boat fleet, uh, a man named Karl Donitz, had warned all of his captains to be wary of these armed merchant cruisers. And in fact, he said, if you, you have to be absolutely surf certain that before you surface to stop a ship and give warning, that that ship is not armed. Because if it's armed, a good gun crew will have you within range before you ever make it onto your bridge. So these captains had gone to sea with, I don't know, were these conflicting rules or, or could they work it out? Uh, we'll have to wait and see. But now, back to our story. On Saturday evening, as Athenia was sailing north up the Irish Sea, a woman passenger who was traveling alone slipped and fell on the stairs and was knocked unconscious. Now, the cabin crew couldn't revive her, and uh, Chief Officer Copeland was nearby, and he helped to transport this woman to uh, the ship's sick bay. And then he waited for the doctor's report because he wanted to make sure the captain had the latest information when they met later that evening. Well, the doctor told uh, Copeland that the woman had not regained consciousness while he had uh, bandaged up her wounds and stitched up several uh, cuts, and her face was very badly swollen. So he had decided to sedate her for another 24 hours. The thought being that when she finally did awaken, some of that swelling would have gone down, she would be in a little less discomfort, and uh, they would be better able to determine uh, the, the extent of her injuries. The next morning, Sunday, September 3rd, uh, dawned kind of sunny with a lot of clouds in the sky. And as the first passengers began sitting down to breakfast on Athenia, the ship's fate was about to be decided a thousand miles to the east in the German capital of Berlin. At exactly 9 a.m. Berlin time, the British ambassador to Germany, a man named Neville Henderson, Sir Neville Henderson, and that's him over here on the left with the umbrella. He paid a call on the German foreign minister and delivered an ultimatum from His Majesty's government. The ultimatum said, essentially, that unless Germany were prepared to stop all hostilities in Poland by noon that same day, Berlin time, a state of war would exist between England and Germany. Well, the deadline came and went without any word from the German government. And 15 minutes later, the British Prime Minister, Neville Chamberlain, went on the radio to announce to his countrymen and to the world that for the second time in the 20th century, England and Germany were at war. Now, news of this announcement was picked up almost immediately by Athenia, and she began to sail her zigzag course as directed. The captain also directed the deck crew to come up on deck and ready all 26 of the ship's lifeboats to be launched just as a precaution. Well, as you might imagine, it was a tense afternoon. But by the evening, Athenia had sailed to 250 miles northwest of Ireland, and practically everyone on board believed they had sailed beyond the reach of this newly declared war. But they had no way of knowing that at 4.30 that afternoon, a lookout on board U-30 
had spotted Athena's smoke on the northeastern horizon. And Oberleutnant Lemp put his boat on a course he thought would intersect that of the ship that was coming up over the horizon. Then he sailed at a top speed uh, of 16 knots on the surface, pounding through the ocean swells to try and close the distance between these two ships. And by sunset, he thought he was close enough that a, a, a sharp-eyed lookout might actually see him. So without yet being able to positively identify what kind of a ship he was tracking, he called his crew to battle stations and he submerged his boat. Now, what went on next? We don't really know in terms of what went through Lemp's mind, but this is how I described it in my book. With U-10 running at periscope depth on a course now nearly parallel to the approaching ship, Lemp could make only eight knots with his electric motors. He calculated he, could have, he would have less than 30 minutes before the big ship passed him, but he didn't have much time. If he decided to attack, uh, it would be a quick maneuver to round his bow in, to starboard and bring her into firing position, but he didn't have much time. Seated in the conning tower's small combat center directly above the U-boat's control room, Lemp raised the attack periscope. Through the eyepiece, he quickly spotted the ship, which continued on her general westerly course. One quick look, and he lowered the scope, still unable to make a positive identification. He continued to track the ship, uh, his unsuspecting prey, for 20 more minutes, periodically raising and lowering the scope to follow her movements. Time was growing short, and he had to decide. In the scope's eyepiece, the ship was a little more than a mile away, a black silhouette against a darkening sky. Something was different. It took him a moment to realize the ship had extinguished all its lights. Through the attack scope, he saw what could be a cargo boom, or could it be the barrel of a deck gun? In an instant, the anomalies fell into place. Blacked out, zigzagging, sailing out of normal shipping lanes, he did not question his conclusion. This was an armed merchant cruiser. Well, at 7.38, Lemp fired at least two torpedoes at Athenia, and one ran true and struck the ship about two-thirds of the way down her port side in the number five hold just astern of the engine room. The blast instantly killed an estimated 50 passengers and crew. It also severed oil lines, which caused all the ship's engines to shut down. And it knocked the main generator offline so that every light inside the ship went out as Athenia coasted to a stop in the Atlantic Ocean. Well, this is a model of the Athenia that is on display in the Riverside Museum of, in Glasgow. And I put this up on the screen because uh, it'll help you place uh, some activities on deck uh, right after the torpedo struck. Now, my grandmother actually had decided to come up on deck after her dinner uh, and take in some fresh air before going down uh, to her cabin to go to bed. And she had worn her heavy wool coat up on deck because she knew she was gonna be sitting there and it would be cold. And that's where she was on the starboard side of the ship when the torpedo struck. And after she gathered herself up off the deck, she turned around and looked out uh, over the port side railing because the ship was kind of leaning in that direction. And she saw this long, dark object in the ocean. And she knew it was a submarine and that they had been torpedoed. At about that same time, Chief Officer Copeland, who had been in the first class dining room and had just ordered his chicken dinner, uh, when the, there was a crash that shook the room and plunged it into darkness. Well, he knew that something was terribly wrong. He didn't know what it was. Whatever it was, it had occurred near the stern, and so he began to move immediately in that direction through the darkened ship. He, it took him maybe three or four minutes, but he finally came out on this deck here, A deck, 
And at the time, there was enough light in the twilight for him to see immediately that the stern was riding low in the water. But the list to port that he had detected in the darkened ship as he was moving seemed to be holding steady at about five or six degrees. So he then turned to come to this stairway. Whoops. Back, back, back. Sorry. He turned to go to this stairway here. And as he did, he looked over his left shoulder and out to sea. And he saw the same thing my grandmother saw. He saw the submarine uh, with a dark cloud of smoke around its conning tower, which he took to mean that the ship had just su surfaced and was starting her diesel engines. And at that moment, he knew that Athenia had been torpedoed. And he wondered why uh, the submarine had not fired another torpedo. He could not have been prepared, however, for what he saw when he got up onto the next highest deck, which was the promenade deck here. This heavy wooden hatch cover over the number five hold had been blown completely away. And the deck was littered with debris that, from the hold that had come up through the force of the explosion. But most distressing of all, probably for him, was the sight of four or five bodies lying on the deck around the open hold here. So he crossed, crossed over to check for signs of life among these people. And while he was doing that, Athenia sounded the emergency signal to abandon ship. So Copeland's duty station at that point then was on the very top deck, this, this deck here. He went up this last stairway to the port side of what was called the boat deck because most of the lifeboats were located on that deck. And he was responsible for overseeing the loading and launching of the seven lifeboats on the port side of the boat deck. And as he began to direct the sailors to bring the top boats up and out and down so they could be uh, boarded by passengers, the ship's nurse found him and reminded him that she had a patient in, in the woman's ward in sick bay, and that she could not get this woman off the ship by herself. Well, Copeland told her not to worry about the, the woman patient, that he would see to it that she was taken care of. He told the nurse to go back down onto the promenade deck and see if anything could be done for the people who he'd seen badly burned and injured lying on the deck there. Then he turned to two sailors and he told them that to go immediately down to sick bay to the woman's ward where they would find a patient and that they should get her off the ship quickly and as safely as possible. And he warned them that she might still be unconscious. Well, by now, passengers were streaming up on deck to go to their muster stations. And it was about 20 minutes later, after darkness had fallen, that Lemp brought U-30 to the surface because he wanted to see how fast this ship was settling. He wanted to make sure it would sink. And as he watched, uh, he made the decision that it was not sinking fast enough. So he ordered his uh, first watch officer to fire another torpedo at Athenia, which he did. But this torpedo failed to detonate. And while he was on the bridge, he received a note from his radio operator. And the radio operator was picking up a message from the ship they had torpedoed. And the ship was broadcasting an SOS without using any code or just broadcasting in the clear, saying that it was sinking fast and identifying itself as Athenia. So Oberleutnant Lemp consulted U-30's copy of the Lloyd's Register of Ships, the British insurance company that insured almost every ship in the world, and discovered that Athenia was a passenger ship. This was exactly the kind of ship he was not supposed to attack. And it was a terrible mistake for this young officer. And in the end, he decided that he would leave the scene without offering any help to anybody in the lifeboats, which he was required to do by the London Submarine Protocol. And more importantly, he decided not to break radio silence, so he did not report to his superiors what he had done. Well, it took about an hour and 15, hour and 20 minutes to get all the lifeboats launched, but they were all safely launched. And there were, that left about 20 people 
on, on board. It was the captain, the rest of the officers, maybe a dozen deck crew, and, and five passengers. And the captain sent for his chief officer and asked Copeland to go below and make an evaluation of whether or not Athenia would be able to stay afloat long enough to be towed to a port and repaired. So Copeland took a flashlight and he walked each of the darkened decks, each succeedingly lower deck, checking the progress of the water toward midships. He called out as he went to make sure nobody was trapped in their cabins. And he checked the sick bay as he went by. He found one door was locked. That was probably the men's ward, which had not been in use. The other ward, the door was open and the bed was empty. So the two sailors he had sent down had apparently done their job. And in the end, he returned to the captain and told him that although the water was coming in slowly and Athena would stay afloat for several more hours, probably, she would not stay afloat long enough to be towed to a port for repairs. And so the captain then gave the abandoned ship order for the rest of the people on board. They called one of the two motor launches uh, that Athena had over to the side of the ship. And at about 11.30, all the rest of the people on board abandoned ship, and she was left to her fate. Well, at this point, all 26 lifeboats were arrayed in a rough circle around Athenia because they knew any rescue vessels picking up the SOS would be coming to this location. So they tried to keep Athenia in sight. But conditions in these boats could not have been very pleasant. Even though it was early September, it was still quite cold uh, on the Atlantic Ocean at night in an open boat. There was a steady wind rising and there were intermittent rain showers through the area to make things worse. Some of these boats were very crowded. In fact, my grandmother uh, was one of the last persons into a lifeboat that was so crowded she had to stand. But she was wearing her heavy wool coat. Uh, and because she was, there was a woman sitting in front of her holding a baby and asked my grandmother if she would please hold the child under her coat to keep it warm and out of the rain, which she did for about an hour, uh, maintaining her balance as the ship, uh, the little lifeboat rode up and over the ocean swells until finally another woman agreed to take the baby and a third woman gave up a seat so that my grandmother could sit down. Now there were several people in these lifeboats who were wearing little more than their pajamas or their nightgowns under their life jackets because they'd been asleep when the signal to abandon ship had sounded. Others who had been up on deck like my grandmother, had made the decision when they heard the signal that they could not go down two or three decks in the dark and find their cabin in the dark to retrieve their life vests. So several people boarded these lifeboats without any life vests on. Some of them leaked, and where they did, uh, the passengers would tear off pieces of their clothing and jam it into the cracks where the water was coming in, hoping to slow down the leaks. And if that didn't help, then they had a bailing bucket. And if the bailing bucket wasn't enough, then women used their purses to bail water, and men would use their shoes to bail water. So some of these boats had some pretty grim conditions. And these were the situation, a situation that, that persisted anywhere from, say, 5 to 12 hours, depending on when a lifeboat was rescued. The first rescue ship on scene was a Norwegian uh, freighter named Nut Nelson. Uh, and she was able to rescue 430 survivors. But unfortunately, during the rescue operations, a lifeboat was caught in the starboard propeller of the ship and chopped to pieces, throwing about 80 to 90 people into the water. And it was estimated that roughly half of these people did not survive the night. The second light, uh, rescue ship to arrive showed up at about 2.30, about a half hour after the Newt Nelson. This was the Southern Cross, and it was a luxury yacht that had once been owned by the American industrialist Howard Hughes. But it was now the property of a Swedish millionaire uh, who, with his wife, was on his way to the Bahamas, where he was going to wait out the war. 
And they had picked up the uh, SOS signal and had altered course to come and rescue passengers. To give you a sense of how large this yacht was, she rescued 376 survivors, one of whom was my grandmother. And somehow, when she was on uh, the Southern Cross, she learned that the source of the owner's wealth was the Electrolux vacuum cleaner company. <laughs> So she made a vow if she got back to Rochester, New York, <laughs> and she did buy an Electrolux vacuum cleaner. Now, just before dawn, three Royal Navy destroyers arrived on the scene, and while one destroyer conducted anti-submarine operations circling the entire area to make sure there were no U-boats uh, in, the, in the area, HMS Electra and HMS Escort rescued nearly 500 more passengers. And when the sun came up on Sunday morning, or Monday morning, September the 4th, it showed Athenia was still afloat, but just barely. Her stern had disappeared beneath the water, and she was now listing maybe 15 uh, degrees or more to port. And this is the view, quite possibly, that Chief Officer Copeland might have had when he was one of the last people rescued um, by HMS Escort. I'm sorry, HMS Electra, although it doesn't really matter. Um, while he was on Electra, he checked the sick bay to see if the woman uh, had been transferred there. And she was not there. So he found his way to the radio room, and he asked the radio operators to quickly check each of the other rescue ships in the area to find out where the woman had been transferred. Well, they contacted. Uh, all the other rescue ships, and she wasn't on any of the rescue ships. This meant that somehow she had been left on board Athenia. And he couldn't understand how that might have happened. But as he thought about it, he realized that maybe the door he had thought had been locked had been jammed shut by the force of the explosion. And if that was the case, well, the two sailors they had sent down would have come to the same conclusion he had. The men's ward was locked, the women's ward was empty, so someone else had taken the woman off the ship. It also meant that she would be trapped in that room, unable to get out, and would drown when Athenia sank, which she was certainly going to do. So Copeland convinced Electra's captain to bring his, his destroyer to a stop long enough so that Copeland and two other volunteers from Athenia's crew could climb into a motor launch and go across to the sinking ship, which they did. They found a ladder dangling in the water, climbed up onto what probably was the promenade deck, then climbed up the deck to a stairway and went down into the ship. And by the time they got to the ship's sick bay, they were in water up to their knees. And his flashlight immediately showed him that the door was misaligned. So yes, uh, it wasn't really locked. It was just jammed. So the three men put their shoulders to the door and finally got it to open. And they discovered the woman was still there. And she was still unconscious. And the water was just below the level of the mattress. Well, they got her into a blanket. Uh, they got her back up the stairway then down the deck and somehow down this rope ladder into the motor launch and came back across to HMS Electra. Fifteen minutes later, <laughs> yeah, hard to believe, but it's true. Fifteen minutes later, Athenia rolled over and sank. Now, uh, a few months later, while Copeland was back at sea, he learned that he had been awarded an OBE, an Order of the British Empire uh, Medal, uh, by King George V, VI, excuse me, for his bravery and leadership in uh, the evacuation of the Athenia, which was entirely appropriate and quite an honor. Now, the last rescue ship to arrive on scene was the aforementioned City of Flint. This was an American freighter, and uh, though not in this picture, she had a very large American flag painted on each side of her uh, hull because America was a neutral country and was not, uh, did not want to be involved in any war and wanted to make sure that any of the combatants knew this was an American ship. Now, 
the Southern Cross did not have enough water or food to carry 376 passengers onto Bermuda. So the captain of City of Flint agreed to take any of the passengers off the yacht who wanted to continue uh, their, their trip across the Atlantic uh, to America. And 236 of those passengers, including my grandmother, decided to transfer to the city of Flint, which then left immediately for the largest nearby port, and that was Halifax, Nova Scotia. The remaining 140 people on board the yacht opted to go on one of the two destroyers, the Royal Navy destroyers, which then sailed immediately for Glasgow. And the Newt Nelson, which was, had rescued 430 passengers, was a Norwegian ship. Norway was also a neutral country, and the Norwegian owners wanted the captain of the, uh, the Newt Nelson to take his passengers to the nearest neutral port, and that was Galway in the Republic of Ireland. So we had four ships taking Athena survivors to three different countries at the beginning of the Second World War. So it took a few days, maybe a little longer, to get a comprehensive uh, list of those who survived and, by implication, those who did not. And the final accounting showed 112 men, women, and children had died in the attack on Athena. The question now for us is, why don't we remember this? Why has this event faded into the shadows of history? Well, there are probably several good reasons. One of them has to be the fact that 112 people were the total uh, uh, deaths recorded when Athena sank. As I mentioned, uh, we've, we all seem to remember the Lusitania, uh, which was sunk by a German U-boat in the First World War, and the loss of life in that sinking was nearly 1,200 people. So comparing 112 to 1,200, uh, we seem to have a penchant for remembering the larger disasters like Lusitania and, and Titanic, and not the smaller ones. And thank God, Athenia was not nearly the tragedy it could have been. Another reason, or contributing factor, let's say, was the fact that uh, Germany de denied any responsibility for having sunk Athenia. And that is an outgrowth of the fact that Lemp did not uh, report what he had done. So on September 4th, Monday, when reports began to circulate that a German U-boat had sunk a, uh, a, a defenseless passenger ship, the German government checked with the Navy, the Navy checked with, uh, with the submarine command, and the submarine command was able to say, maybe disingenuously, no. that none of its U-boats had reported any action in the area where Athena was sunk. So Germany denied any responsibility. And in fact, within a couple of days, Joseph Goebbels, the chief propagandist for the Nazi party, published a story in the newspaper that claimed that Winston Churchill had placed a bomb on board Athenia <laughs> so that it would go off mid-Atlantic, sink the ship, kill Americans, and bring the United States into the war on the side of the British. Well, Probably not too many people outside of Germany believe that story, and maybe not even that many people in Germany. But nevertheless, even after Lemp returned to port and told his commander what he had done, Germany continued to, uh, to deny any responsibility. And it wasn't until 1946 at the Nuremberg trials that Karl Donitz, whoops, where am I here? Wrong way, sorry. Karl Donitz, and he is the man on the left in the sunglasses, who was in charge of the submarine fleet at the time of Athena's sinking, he admitted in deposition that, yes, U-30 had sunk Athena. But by that time, it was a little more than a footnote in history. Another reason we don't know anything about this is because although 30 Americans died uh, when Athena sank, President Roosevelt knew that there was the isolationist sentiment in Congress was too strong to get a declaration of war based on these 30 deaths. But he did use the incident as leverage to help change the neutrality laws for the United States in a way that favored the British over the Germans. 
still another reason why we are not so uh, surprised at the, the fact that Athenia was sunk without warning is because within a couple of months, Germany began to indiscriminately sink merchant ships without giving any warning at all. They abandoned the London submarine protocol. And as soon as that happened, so did, Germ so did Britain and so did France. So the submarine protocol did not last more than three months into the Second World War. But finally, and probably the greatest reason uh, for us not being aware of Athena's uh, tragedy is that the, there was the utter devastation that the Second World War wreaked upon the world. It's estimated that somewhere between 24 and 25 million men and women in uniform died in, as a result of the war. But civilian deaths are estimated somewhere between 50 and 55 million. So it's easy to see how 112 deaths at the beginning of the war overwhelmed by such a huge number. But we can say that the 112 men, women, and children who died uh, when Athena was sunk were all civilians. And as such, you could see them as harbingers of the fate that was going to await so many other civilians in the world in the nearly six years of war that would follow. So thank you very much. And if you have any questions, thank you. Thank you very much. Now, I should mention that I do have books for sale. The question was, what happened to my grandmother? Um, well, uh, she returned home. She was 54 years old. She survived. She wrote her little uh, memoir uh, and then lived a fairly uneventful night, except for the fact that she tried all her life to get reparations from the German government for all her possessions and, by the way, the wedding presents she was bringing back for my mother, who, her daughter, who had just been married uh, before she went to England. And she was bringing all these, everything went to the bottom of the sea. So, but apart from that, it was a relatively uneventful life. She died when I was 13 years old um, in uh, the mid-50s. She was about 72 or 73 when she died. Any other questions? Uh, oh, one here. How old were you when you first learned this story? Ah, that's a good question. Um, I was probably seven or eight years old when I was made aware that Grandma had been sunk by a German submarine <laughs> um, in the war. And you would think that an eight-year-old boy would find that fascinating. But I never, I never asked her about it. It never occurred to me to ask her about it. And it, wasn't, it was, wasn't until I was in uh, junior high school and we were studying world history that the history teacher uh, mentioned the Lusitania and the fact that it was sunk uh, by a German submarine, a passenger ship, and all these people lost their lives. And I, said, I went up to him after class and I said, my grandmother was on the Lusitania. <laughs> so then. I went, uh, went home and I, I said, do we have anything from grandma about uh, the Lusitania when she was sunk? And I, my, my uh, mother said, she wasn't on the Lusitania, she was on the Athenia. And she was, that was sunk in the Second World War, so I had to go back into class. <laughs> I made sure I was the first one in and explained to the, the history teacher that she was not on the Lusitania, she was on the Athenia. And he said to me, and I remember, I, I've never heard of the Athenia. So maybe that planted a seed in the back of my mind that someday I wanted to do something to make people more aware of, of the Athenia, but yeah. Yes, the question is, are there, were there any outstanding archives or, or libraries that were instrumental uh, in my research? And boy, yeah, there were a lot. One of the, one of the we, we spent five years researching and writing this book, and one of the biggest treasure troves was in the US archives in College Park, Maryland. Because what happened was, because Germany denied any responsibility for having sunk Athenia, and Americans were trying to get uh, reparations for what they'd lost, like my grandmother, the State Department, not really being in, wanting to be too involved directly in the war, uh, 
decided to ask everybody who, Americans who were on board the ship, and there were about 300 initially, to please file an affidavit with the State Department on what they saw and what they did when Athenia was sunk. And all these affidavits, including my grandmother's, is on, are on file uh, in uh, the uh, archive in College Park, Maryland. So uh, it was a great treasure trove of information. And then, of course, the British archives uh, in Kew, outside of London, had all of the official inquiry about why uh, Athenia was sunk and what happened. And uh, Copeland had something like a 10-page uh, uh, file, uh, affidavit that he filed about what happened and what he did during the sinking. And um, probably one of the most interesting was uh, the newspaper files in Edinburgh, in the library in Edinburgh, because I wanted to find out what had happened to everybody that I profiled in the book one of whom was obviously Barnett Copeland. And I, I knew when Barnett Copeland died, but I didn't know uh, what his career in, was involved. He uh, undoubtedly was bright enough and motivated enough to go on and become a, a captain uh, in the merchant fleet, I think, or maybe even uh, a naval reserve officer. And I knew he won the OBE, and I knew roughly when he died. And we started to look through the newspapers to, to find the obituaries. Uh, because I thought it would be fairly big. Um, and it was actually my wife who finally found this uh, little one-inch <laughs> story uh, about his death, said he w had won the OBE, had uh, been aboard the Athenian when it was torpedoed, and he had finished his career as a Clyde pilot, that is, a uh, pilot who guided ships on the Clyde River down from Glasgow on out to the Irish Sea. So obviously, something convinced him not to continue um, his career uh, as, as a merchant marine officer. Uh, and so uh, that was an interesting um, revelation for me. What is the story of the unconscious woman? Um, <laughs> her name was Rose Griffin. And I am sorry to tell you, she never regained consciousness and died about three days later in a hospital in Glasgow. Yeah. So her story is very short. Were any of the 112 who perished Americans? Yes, 30 uh, Americans died uh, in, the, in the sinking. Uh, was this 79 years ago when this happened? And your math is spot on. Yes, it was 79 years ago last September 3rd. Did we speak to any survivors? Well, in a matter of fact, we spoke to five survivors. Uh, hard to believe the oldest one uh, at the time of the torpedoing uh, was a woman. She was 24 years old, and we spoke to her in her mid-90s. Uh, she lived on, in Garden City, Long Island, and uh, she was very hospitable. We called and, and went out and, and spoke to her. And it's interesting because her memories uh, were locked in. She remembered what she remembered, having told this story over and over. And when I asked her a question like, what, would, what did your cabin look like? You know, how big was it? She couldn't tell me. She couldn't remember that. She just remembered where she was when the torpedo hit and how she got into the lifeboat and, you know, how she was rescued uh, by the Newt Nelson, I believe it was. Um, so uh, yes, we did. And we talked to descendants of survivors that we tracked down. Um, and many of them had accounts that their parents had written or that they had interviewed their parents and, and written down uh, the accounts. And they shared those accounts with us. And in one such case, uh, who, a person who's in the book, um, who was a Polish uh, farmer at the time, uh, who was getting out of Poland before Hitler came in and got his family out. And I, I talked to his granddaughter. And she gave me this wonderful uh, family story about how his wife made him go see a fortune teller before she would leave Poland, because she wanted to know if their family was cursed. So, so uh, you know, some, some very interesting stories. There are other stories like this in the book. So, uh, you know. Yes, sir. Yeah. What happened to the German U-boat captain? 
uh, who uh, violated the protocol. Well, by the time he got back to port, Germany had been denying this uh, matter for two weeks. Uh, his excuse was he thought he was firing on a, an armed merchant cruiser. He was sent to Berlin to tell that story to the German high command, and they accepted his explanation. They also probably didn't want to court-martial a captain for doing something they said they weren't responsible for. <laughs> Nevertheless, he was not court-martialed, and he went on to have a very successful career for the next 20 months. Uh, he became a, what was called a U-boat ace. Uh, he, sang, he was credited for sinking uh, 22, sinking or damaging 22 ships. Uh, he had won the Knight's Cross, which was the German military's highest honor for valor. And uh, he had been promoted to Kapitan Leutnant. But uh, his boat was sunk uh, in a very dramatic battle uh, on May 9, 1941 a battle that, in fact, wound up uh, getting the Enigma machine from his submarine because it didn't sink right away. And a British boarding party was able to get the Enigma machine and code books, which allowed uh, British intelligence for a couple of months at least to read the German naval signals as they were being broadcast to the ships. So um, he did not survive that. He got off the ship but he disappeared when he was in the water. So nobody knows exactly what happened to him. Um, I have a theory which is in my book, and you'll have to. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you Tom. We have a little gift for you. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you everybody, okay. for being here. Thank you.